Yeah, good afternoon. I'm uh, Andre Boerter. I am the Vultures for Africa Program Manager at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And I'm also the co-chair of the IUCN's Vulture Specialist Group. Um, uh, yeah, so my work in, in vulture conservation spans over more than 20 years, but my conservation background and my work in conservation goes back to as far as 1987, when I started working in conservation in Africa, initially mostly managing protected areas, managing parks. Uh, I was a park warden and then 25 odd years ago moved across into the non-governmental sector uh, in South Africa, initially working for the BirdLife partner, BirdLife South Africa for five years. And then uh, I was recruited by the Endangered Wildlife Trust in 2004. So I've been with them for 19 years and I'm in my 20, 20th year of working for the trust. And my primary focus has been initially birds of prey and vultures, but now since 2017, my primary focus really has been vultures mostly. And that's what I'm working on. And that's what I'm going to share with people today. Many people are aware that African vultures are indeed in, in, in trouble and are declining and have been declining over the last 40 years. But I think it was expressed far more with the publication of this uh, peer reviewed article in Conservation Letters in 2015. Uh, that emphasized the scale of decline that African vultures experienced uh, up to then in the previous 30 years. Uh, and it highlighted the plight of vultures and, and immediately resulted in the uplisting of a significant number of species to either critically endangered or endangered status uh, on the African continent. But I think, you know, rather than me trying to spend a lot of time explaining to you why, I have included a video which we produced uh, in 2020 in cooperation with Cornell Lab of Ornithology that basically in 10 minutes explains to people what the situation with vultures in Africa is and also what we are starting to do to try and reduce the decline and to turn around the decline in total. So I'm going to share that with you first. And then I will talk about some of the specific activities that my program is involved in uh, working in, in various countries on the continent. Fifty-four countries covering more than 30 million square kilometers. Africa is a mosaic of cultures and growing economies. Future economic growth will depend on expanding infrastructure, improving healthcare, and increasing municipal services. One service, often overlooked, that transcends political boundaries is carcass and organic waste disposal, a service provided by vultures. It exists not an animal sur terre qui puisse faire aussi bien le travail d'écarissage que les vautours. If vultures disappear from the space, there will be lots of carcasses there. Where are we going to take them? African vultures span the continent. Many species travel rapidly over long distances, identifying carcasses from the air as they follow herd animals like wildebeest and zebras. The Egyptian vulture can migrate over 6,000 kilometers twice a year. Here are the paths traveled by four individuals. The hooded vulture travels shorter distances. In West Africa, it is found mostly in cities and towns where it disposes of carrion and other waste. Here, two individuals work in communities in the Gambia. The white-backed vulture soars above the savanna, covering wide ranges in search of food. This individual flew from Botswana to Tanzania in the span of four months. Vultures are highly specialized and efficient scavengers. Their powerfully acidic stomachs neutralize bacteria found in decaying and diseased animals. 
we understand they're not pretty, but they provide a vital service. And that service is they get rid of carcasses, which would potentially spread diseases to livestock, to other wildlife, to humanity. And they provide this service for free. And yet, these creatures who play an overlooked role in our economy are one of the most threatened groups of terrestrial birds on the planet. Mali, hooded vultures which clean waste at dump sites have not been seen in Bamako since 2003. Over the past 50 years, they have declined across Africa by 83%. Angola, white-backed vultures that once disposed of wildebeest carcasses have disappeared from the country. They've declined by 90% across the continent. Chad, white-headed vultures are almost entirely confined to protected areas. Throughout Africa, their population has plummeted by 96%. Sudan, Rupel's vultures, like all vultures, take up to six years to reach sexual maturity, and when they do reproduce, have few offspring. Their populations have decreased across Africa by 97%. The collapse of vulture populations is widespread and common. We are now living in the midst of the African vulture crisis, a wide-scale event with many causes. Loss of habitat for nesting, roosting and foraging, the trade in vulture body parts, and electrocutions and collisions with an expanding energy infrastructure are key issues. But the single greatest threat to African vultures is poison, contributing to over 60% of all vulture deaths. If we manage the issue of poisoning, then we have managed a bigger percentage of the threats that are affecting vultures. Vultures are especially vulnerable to the widespread misuse of inexpensive toxic pesticides because hundreds of them can unwittingly feed on a single poisoned carcass. Eventually, these toxins cascade through the ecosystem, threatening other wildlife, finding their way into the soil and water of our communities. If the elephant is poisoned, for example, then vultures can feed, lions can feed, jackals can feed, so a whole lot of animals can die. Lorsque une carcasse est intoxiquée et empoisonnée, ce n'est pas seulement les vautours qui sont intoxiqués. Il y a aussi toute une gamme d'autres animaux voilà, qui sont parallèlement tués. Des bousiers et même certains micro-organismes eh, qui font aussi eh bien, le travail euh, de charouillants qui sont éliminés. It's a huge risk that people really don't understand. It's not only going to affect vultures, it's not only going to affect carnivores, it affects livestock, it eventually affects humans. As vultures decline, the services they provide also decline. And in the absence of vultures, populations of less specialized scavengers may increase. Scientists think the consequences could be far-reaching. Ces charouillants de moins d'efficacité que sont les rats, et les mouches, et les chiens errants, peuvent être des sources potentielles donc de transmission de maladies humaines et animales. As vulture populations further decline, you're looking at consequences for environmental health, you're looking at consequences for the spread of diseases, but also the aesthetic value that vultures bring both for tourism and culturally. Africa's vultures travel across the continent efficiently maintaining balanced environments. Experts are concerned that what replaces the work of vultures will be costly for ecosystems and human communities. Si les vautours venaient à disparaître, donc les communautés locales 
serait obligé de mettre en place un système de caritage avec un personnel à prendre en charge, et des véhicules et du carburant. Et tout ça, ça sera à la charge du contribuable. You cannot think about all these well carcasses lying all over the place, livestock, no vultures to clear them, unimaginable. In 2017, the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species developed a science-based action plan to protect all African vultures across the continent. It is very important for countries, for governments, for communities to collaborate because it's, it's a species that cuts across borders, it's a species that covers a huge range, so we, we need to collaborate. The Multi-Species Action Plan provides a coordinated framework for vulture recovery. It identifies regional threats and actions governments can take. For example, the plan presents site-specific strategies to help manage population declines from animal trade, develop bird-friendly energy infrastructure, and eliminate the wide-scale use of poison. Healthy vulture populations and the ecosystem services they offer protect our communities, our environment, and our future economic development on a national and continental scale. L'importance d'une espèce, le plus souvent, on le reconnaît lorsque l'espèce disparaît. In just over nine minutes, this group of white-backed vultures did what they've done for millennia. They cleaned and processed a carcass from the community for free. Qu'il n'est pas tard et qu'il faut agir parce que le niveau de déclin de vautour africain est certes élevé, mais on a une marge de manœuvre si nous vous entreprenons des actions fortes et urgentes. Shared species, shared priorities, a shared vision for the future. The time to act is now. To find out what you can do, please look to the Multi-Species Action Plan or its summary online. Um, yeah, I, th I think the most important factor and threat that affects vultures across Africa by far is poisoning. Um, uh, you know, the, the poisoning is is done for, for various reasons and has various drivers of which conflict with other wildlife in, in Africa is, is fairly common and widespread, where people have challenges with large carnivores like lions and leopards, hyenas, uh, etc., that uh, they perceive to pose a threat to their, to their livestock. Uh, but also large herbivores like elephant and buffalo that uh, can cause extensive crop damage and so on. And people sometimes also perceiving the animals themselves as posing a threat to their lives and their livelihoods uh, overall. And very often the easiest and, and the first intervention that people think about to try and prevent this from happening uh, is to use poison. And very often if they succeed in killing the animal, the animals are left out in the field and, and, and the vultures then feed on the carcasses and they get killed, sometimes in quite large numbers. So looking at the data that you see on this info, infographic here, uh, based on, on what we've seen over the last 30, 40 years, is 61% of the vultures that have died in Africa have died as a result of poisoning. Uh, a lot of that uh, incidental victims, in other words, they were not the intended targets, but by doing the work that vultures do ecologically, they become uh, they become the innocent victims in in the poisonings. And then when you look at the second category, just uh, category below that, uh, which we call persecution, uh, this is where people intentionally kill vultures for various purposes. One of the main purposes there is people killing birds and then collecting body parts from the birds for uh, certain belief and cultural uses. Um, but then also there, there could be conflict that develops between people and vultures at some uh, uh, at some junction or people in certain parts, in particular in, in certain parts in West Africa, also hunt vultures as a source of food. And they do use poison for this purpose quite often. 
in actual fact, then you can add the 29% to the 61%, which basically tells you that 90% of the vultures that die in Africa and that have died in Africa over the last 30 years have died because of poisoning. And that's why it's one of the main focal, focal areas of the work that we do is to try and reduce the impact of poisoning on vultures, but also on other wildlife. Um, we do collect information on these poisoning incidents from across Africa. We have established the African Wildlife Poisoning Database. And at the moment, we have information on more than 1,500 poisoning incidents across the continent. You can see the total number of animal mortalities there numbers about 45,000, uh, heading towards 46,000. But when you look at the block uh, on the right-hand side there, that figure of 16,000 plus is the number of vulture mortalities that are reflected within the database. And, and that shows you by far that vultures are the group of animals that are most severely affected by the poisoning. More than a third of the mortalities that have been recorded overall uh, in the database consists of vultures. And then that tells you that, that they are very, very severely impacted by poisoning of various forms. The program that I manage uh, called the Vultures for Africa program is based within the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Uh, but its main focus is to work towards promoting and ensuring the implementation of the CMS Vulture Multi-Species Action Plan, which was drafted in 2016-17 um, and which was adopted by all 124 of the range states, including Switzerland. Um, and uh, it, it focuses on three continents, Africa, Europe and Asia. Uh, and I was the project leader for the drafting of that plan uh, back in 2016-17. In and um, when we finished the project, I asked for the opportunity through my employer to work within Africa to, to promote the implementation of the plan. And, and that's the main focus of the work that I do. Uh, and obviously, one of the main focal areas is to address and try and reduce the impact of the threats of which poisoning is the most significant. Um, we also look at innovative approaches to vulture conservation to, to try and work at the cutting edge to try and use various means to improve what we already have been doing over the last 50 years. Um, and then also very importantly for me is to develop conservation capacity within Africa to, in other words, to bring Africans into this process of conserving Africa's vultures. In other words, the, the primary aim of that activity is to develop and capacitate Africans to take responsibility to become the custodians uh, of Africa's vultures. Um, and at the moment, it, it is a challenge in many areas where there's very little expertise and to develop that expertise in, uh, in, in good time. So that is a major focus of what we are doing. We basically uh, divide the activities of, of our program into three activities. Um, the first project focuses on wildlife poisoning prevention and response. And there are a wide range of activities related to this, which unfortunately I don't have a huge amount of time to share with you today. Um, I probably need about a week to talk to you about all of the individual activities that we are doing. But I think the key thing for us is to engage with people on the ground. Uh, on the one hand is to engage with communities. The uh, infographics that you see on the right-hand side of that slide have been developed to make communities aware of the risk of using poisoned wildlife products, uh, whether it is for belief-based use purposes or in many parts of Africa, people use poison to hunt animals and they then consume those animals as food or they sell that meat to other people as a source of food. And of course, that results in many people becoming seriously ill and people dying as a result of that. Uh, and part of our responsibility towards the communities that we work in is to make them aware of this threat uh, and to provide them with guidance in terms of what to do and how to prevent themselves from using these poison wildlife products. So that is one of the focal areas. But we work across a wide spectrum of, of aspects, as you can see in the list there, uh, you know, that sort of higher level interventions working with governments to make sure that there's appropriate legislation in place. And if not, is to improve that legislation, but also importantly, is to enforce the legislation effectively in many of these countries. And uh, those of you that are from Africa will probably not uh, not differ from me too much when, when, you, when I say that law enforcement is a very flexible concept uh, within Africa. So it, it generally is, is a challenge, uh, but then also looking at uh, other aspects and other activities that we can assist with and that we can support countries with in terms of improving the control 
and and the management of these of these chemical substances that are used to poison vultures and other wildlife with so, you know one of our biggest challenges is that agrochemicals are very widely available they are easy to come by they are very affordable um, and people have ready access to them different to many other means of, of hunting animals and that's part of the challenge for us as well so we've also developed a wildlife poisoning response training a module which we uh, use and, and the, the list that you see on the left hand side here are the modules within this training workshop that we do present to conservationists, field rangers, veterinarians, law enforcement officers, uh, and a range of other uh, interested parties in various countries in Africa is to go and work with people on the ground at the coal face of conservation because many people that work at that level are not aware of poisoning. They're not aware of what it looks like. Uh, and when they are confronted with it, very often they don't know how to deal with the situation and how to effectively manage it. And very importantly, to clean up a poisoning scene so that no further poisoning takes place. So that's the main focus of, of our work, uh, to cover all of those areas of training uh, and also to train trainers in the countries that that we work in, so that that skills and the capacity uh, expansion can happen a lot faster in countries where there are trainers. Uh, so we have trainers in the countries that are listed here. And um, in short, this is the sort of training that we've done since 2017, at the moment in 17 countries. And Probably by the end of next week, it will be, it'll be 18 countries because I'm traveling to Angola on Monday to go and start the first training there. So, um, and as you can see over the last uh, six, seven years, we've trained just under 7,000 people in all of the countries that you see listed there. And on the map, uh, every country there that that is colored in is a country where we've done training so far. Um, and in the countries that are green in color is where we have trained trainers and they are now independently training more people um, at a good rate. You can see, for instance, with Kenya, uh, more than 3,000 individuals have been trained in Kenya alone uh, by those trainers. And, and that just tells you that, you know, developing that, that training capacity in countries, you can have much greater reach much faster um, as long as the message that is conveyed is, is correct and is accurate, which we, we try and ensure as, as we go along. So it's, it's been a major focus, uh, and I've personally traveled to all of the countries there to participate in this in this training and facilitate it. Um, that, as I say, good to know that there are others that are now also working towards this. And then another major challenge that we found, especially when we were drafting this multi-species action plan, was the substantial lack of knowledge about vultures, their biology, vulture populations, population trends, in most African countries, um, you know, uh, we were able to garner extensive information in, in a European context, very often many of the Asian countries. There's also been work done over many years, but in the African context, there still is a huge lack of knowledge about vultures, about vulture populations, population trends, etc. And of course, there's a lack of capacity in terms of researchers on the ground that can conduct this work. And the other component of the work that we do is to capacitate that and to start and initiate projects in these countries. So we've initiated projects working with partners in the countries that are listed there uh, that you can see. Most of the work that we do in, in, in countries uh, that are listed there are focused on protected areas, national parks, because those to a very large extent are strongholds for vultures still on the continent. Um, but then working with partners in those areas and obviously also working with communities around those, those parks to make them aware of the work that we are doing and to identify potential candidates that we can develop and that we can train to become part of the system over the long term. We also are uh, supporting existing work in the countries that are listed there uh, with various partners that, that we are working uh, closely with. Um, and then also in, in, in the last few years, We've also expanded our focus beyond Africa. Uh, I was invited last year to go and do some work and, and work with uh, partners in, in Oman, in, in, the, in the Saudi Peninsula, and then also did some work in Cambodia uh, initially in 2020, and I went back there this year to also assist with capacity development there, which has been pretty successful. Just an example of the work we do in one of the countries being Zambia, where we identify strong in-country partners that we then work with 
and we identify individuals that we that we then develop and train and provide support to to become vulture conservationists, vulture uh, researchers, etc., and to start filling those knowledge gaps in in terms of uh, what we need to know as far as vultures are concerned in the countries. Linked to that, and, and you did specifically ask for this, is uh, training people in basic field skills. Uh, and in particular, there's a significant focus on the tracking of vultures and learning more about the movement biology of vultures within Africa. Uh, so all of the countries that are listed there, we uh, have established tracking samples of vultures. Um, initially, as the main focus was on movement biology to just sort of find out what the birds do, how they use the landscape, where they find food, where the where the breeding sites are, because uh, in many instances we don't even know where vultures breed in many countries. Um, so we've established samples in, in these countries, but we've also, uh, with the challenge that we face with poisoning, we've started using the track birds to actually assist us in finding poisoning incidents a lot faster than what we were able to do in the past. So the track birds that move across the landscape, if they do go and feed at carcasses, especially poison carcasses, and they do become immobile, we now have developed a, a system uh, based and that, that is working with the Earth Ranger software system that will interpret the movement of the bird. And the moment it becomes immobile or there's restricted movement, it will send an alarm to a ranger station uh, in close proximity, making them aware that there is an, an immobilized bird in their area and then requesting them to follow up and, and to go and investigate. And in that manner, we've, uh, in certain areas like the Northern Kruger National Park, for instance, we've been able to find poisoning incidents a lot quicker. Uh, and by intervening and decontaminating those scenes, we've reduced the amount of mortalities that have taken place at those incidents. And in fact, with, with a number of incidents in the last six months, the ranges have been so fast that they found the poisoned carcasses before any other animals could feed on them and cat could be poisoned. In other words, you are able to prevent mortalities completely other than the animal that uh, or the, the carcass that was laced. So we are having good success as far as that is concerned. Um, the emphasis, of course, is on finding these poisoning incidents a lot faster rather than anything else. And I know that there have been some media articles on, uh, you know, people using using the vultures to catch poachers and that sort of thing. That's not the aim of, of what we do. We want to get to those poisoning incidents a lot faster. To give you an idea on the extent of, of, of tracking sample that, that we've deployed in the landscape, the map on the right-hand side is uh, from a paper that we published at the beginning of 2022 and at that stage it sort of summarized the tracking data that was available for gyps vultures in other words cape vultures african white backed vultures and rupel's griffin in africa uh, i then went and with, with my team the map on the on the right hand side unfortunately I, I can't see it too clearly because of the the strip of participants uh, on on my screen but all of those red areas we identified as gap areas in terms of tracking data and last year, we started in, in those areas deploying tracking units. Uh, so in 2022, we deployed 87 tracking units on vultures in the countries that you see listed there. And to date, in 2023, we've deployed uh, another 65 satellite tracking units on vultures in those areas. Um, and that will soon be expanded. Uh, and by the end of the year, we expect to probably have a similar number of, of units deployed than, than we had in 2022. So if you if you add all of these together, at the moment, we have a, a tracking sample of uh, in excess of 200 vultures across East and Southern Africa, whose movements we follow on a day to day basis, and who assist us uh, through their movements and through the system that we've developed to locate poisoning incidents a lot faster. But of course, it's also a massive body of data that we can use, uh, and that we can analyze in terms of movement biology, uh, identifying problem areas, potential areas where they might be at bigger risk of the threats that, that we are aware of. So the data is incredibly valuable uh, and the body of data that we have is growing uh, substantially year on year. This, this is just a, a heat map to show you uh, in terms of the birds that we did fit with tracking in, in 2022. These are the areas that these birds covered in their movements 
uh, in about six to eight months. And it, and it gives you an idea of the extensive coverage of the landscape that vultures do in their finding and their search of food. Uh, but of course, with these birds, wherever we have partners on the ground that assist with the early warning, these birds can assist wherever they go. And wherever we have partners that are part of the system can assist them in finding these poisoning incidents a lot faster. So it's been very beneficial. And uh, working with a number of national parks and a number of protected areas over time, uh, you know, many, many of these people are very, very happy with the, the, the service that vultures provide in terms of assisting to find these poisoning incidents a lot faster. Uh, but just to highlight some of the individual movement uh, data uh, of, of birds, uh, just very briefly, this is one of the birds that we that we tagged in the Bangweulu wetlands in uh, northern Zambia. Uh, the bird spent about two, three months there. And in a period of about 10 days uh, after the breeding season ended, this bird decided to go wandering and it moved through Zambia, through uh, small part of Namibia through all of Botswana and it spent most of the summer in the northern Cape of South Africa. Uh, it's about 2000 kilometers that this bird flew in a period of about 10 days. Um, and covering that sort of distance by individuals is, is certainly fairly commonplace. Um, and it, it's not unusual. We've had even movements of birds from Tanzania down into South Africa. Uh, so they do cover long distances. But of course, if you consider the, the areas that these birds cover, the fact that they uh, cross international boundaries at random um, and regularly, the challenge to conserve them effectively is far more complicated than, for instance, conserving bird or mammals in a fenced off protected area where you have people on the ground that can assist you. These birds are very mobile. So your challenge as far as conservation is concerned is much more complex is geographically far wider than uh, than what we originally anticipated. And our focus is definitely to try and facilitate this cross-border cooperation between various countries to conserve the vultures better. Uh, just some, some more tracking data. You did say that people are interested in this, so I, I did add a few slides as far as that is concerned. So what you see here is the movement data of seven individuals that we've trapped in northern Malawi in the Nika uh, Plateau National Park. Uh, but as you can see, these birds predominantly uh, forage in neighboring Zambia, in in fact, in the Luangwa Valley, uh, which stretches to the southwest of Anika. Uh, and again, it's, it just emphasizes these birds, uh, you know, man-made international boundaries mean absolutely nothing to them. But again, when you also do work in Zambia, this is a sample of birds that we trapped in the Luangwa Valley, very similar movement pattern. And again, it just tells us that we're looking at metapopulations here. And when we conserve these birds, we should conserve them from a metapopulation perspective. Uh, similar movement patterns in uh, in Western Zambia. But then we've also seen with the tracking that we've done that there are basically three subpopulations in Zambia. And these birds, there is some movement between those populations. But to a large extent, the movements are generally from north to the, the southwest and, and back. Uh, that these birds do undertake with a little bit of interaction over time. So what we are trying to do with this tracking then, uh, using them to detect the poisoning incidents, is to create create a range-wide detection web with as many tracked birds as we possibly can. We had a, a stakeholder meeting in November last year at the Pan-African Ornithological Congress where we brought all researchers together that are working on vultures in Africa and that are using tracking as one of the research tools. And the good news is that they all agree to work together. In other words, from our sample of 250 to 60 odd birds, we have now engaged with a group of about eight other researchers working in other countries in Africa, and they are pooling this data uh, for this purpose and working together to try and assist people on the ground to find these poisoning incidents a lot faster. So it's a very positive development from that uh, perspective. Uh, this is just to reiterate the, the tracking sample that, that we have and then expanding our footprint at the moment, looking at expanding to do work in the countries that are listed there. And as I said, when you see Angola there, October 23, that will start next week uh, when I drive up there to, uh, to also expand on the tracking sample. And it will be the first vultures that are tracked and fitted with tracking in Angola. We know that some of our birds do move into Angola but it would be good to establish a sample there. Uh, 
in Ethiopia. We we would like to do more. South Sudan is an area that, by all accounts and with feedback from people on the ground, is incredibly rich in vultures and in vulture diversity, benefiting from large populations of ungulates and predators in the landscape. No work to date has been done in South Sudan. So one of our uh, aims within the next 18 months is to also establish work there and to work with people there. And then the same in Chad, working with partners like Sahara Conservation in Chad and potentially also Niger uh, in, in the near future. And then also expanding on the on the tracking sample in the countries that I mentioned outside of Africa already. Uh, so ultimately, at the moment, we are looking at having tracking samples in all of the countries that you see highlighted there. The countries in yellow already have existing samples. Those are partners that we are now uh, working with together. And then the green, uh, the darker green areas is where we have established tracking samples. And then the paler green is where we aim to establish uh, samples within the next two years or so. Uh, and hopefully, ultimately, to have uh, coverage of most of the vulture range in, in, in Africa, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I mentioned Saudi Arabia, so we are, uh, we've been approached to assist with work there. Uh, they are very keen to re-establish populations, for instance, of Eurasian griffins uh, in Saudi Arabia, but also focusing on Egyptian vultures and the uh, Negevensis race of the leopard face vulture. And uh, we are happy to provide them with assistance and support and training in terms of how we approach the work that we do in, in an African context. And then the same applies to Cambodia in Southeast Asia, where they have an isolated population of three species of critically endangered vultures. And uh, we've provided support and input there over the last uh, three, four years. And uh, I'm happy to say that work there is progressing very well. I have to also share some tracking data of a non-vulture, uh, and that is the Battalier Eagle. Uh, anybody that's been to Africa and to African protected areas have probably seen Battalier Eagles, in my opinion, one of the most attractive of the raptor species in all of Africa, and in fact, probably in all of the world. Um, but what people often don't realize is that Battalier Eagles are also very, very ready scavengers. They scavenge as often as vultures do. They very often tend to locate carcasses before vultures do because they fly at lower altitudes uh, and they scan the landscape. And, and they often land at carcasses first and thereby indicate to vultures where, where carcasses are. But that, of course, also makes them very vulnerable to poisoning as well, similar to the vultures. So what we did uh, in, in some of our field work last year in the Nyasa Special Reserve in northern Mozambique, uh, we, as part of our work, trapped two battalion eagles. Both of them uh, were females. The one was a sub-adult female, the bird that you see in the photograph there, and the other was an immature bird. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, very little is known about the movements of battaliers at all. There's, there's been no movement study of the species at all. Um, and of these two birds, this uh, movement pattern that you see here is of the of the youngest of the two that frequented the Nyasa Reserve, which is south of that yellow line. And But this bird very regularly moved into southern Tanzania, into the Salu Game Reserve, which is one of the largest conservation areas in eastern southern Africa. Uh, but on one occasion also moved to north west of Dar es Salaam, about 140 kilometers from the Kenyan border. Uh, and then the bird returned to Nyasa. So already quite extensive movement from a bird that most people assume is fairly sedentary and does not move very long distances. Um, but this bird uh, started changing our perceptions as far as that is concerned, but not nearly as much as this female that you see in the photograph. Uh, and what you see here is a movement pattern of this bird over a period of two months, uh, where she initially, uh, from Nyasa, flew south, uh, southwest, to an area near the Banyin National Park, which is fairly close to the border with Zimbabwe and South Africa. It's a dis straight line distance of about 1,200 kilometers from Nyasa uh, that this bird moved. She spent three months there, uh, and among the time that she spent there was during this very severe cyclone uh, that we experienced in Southern Africa in February uh, that persisted for about a month, uh, you know, pummeling the area with heavy rainfall, strong winds, and so on. I was very concerned for her welfare, but she survived all of that, and she was able to thrive, to forage, and then she moved back to Nyasa, and within a period of about five days, she flew all the way back there 
uh, this time via Malawi, uh, spending time in two of the national parks that we also work in there. She was back in Nyasa and we thought, okay, well, she's back home safely. She's okay now. And a week later, she said, no, I've not, I've not traveled enough. And she headed north. You can see that, that movement pattern. And in fact, she spent some time in the Tarangir National Park in northern Tanzania uh, for about four or five days. And then she flew all the way back to Nyasa. So around a round trip in a period of about seven to eight weeks of over 5,000 kilometers that was flown by this Batali Eagle. Uh, and again, totally, totally changed our perceptions of the mobility and, and, the, and the movements of the single species. And what it reiterates to us is the need for a detailed movement biology study on the species um, and to learn more because they are, as I've said earlier, just as vulnerable to the poisoning as the vultures are. And they also are affected by the other threats like energy, power lines, et cetera, that they can collide with. So important for us to also focus and expand our vision to other species beyond vultures as, as far as this work is that, uh, that we are busy with. Uh, getting back to some of the other work that, that we do, the map on the right-hand side here is from my office. Uh, and it basically just all of the green pins that you see there are project sites that I'm currently actively working in in Africa. Uh, the yellow sites are sites that we will likely reach with, within uh, the next 18 months or so. Um, and the red pins are projects that are ongoing that I was part of historically in South Africa and still working on in particular in the Kruger National Park in, in South Africa. Uh, so again, there's a long list of focal areas, uh, 2023, 2024, but I specifically want to focus on the two that are highlighted there, the aerial surveys of, of certain areas, and then the wildlife poisoning sniffer dog capacity that we are in the process of developing. So um, I've just come back from the Kruger National Park. I'm back in Johannesburg now for a few days. Um, and we've, over the last two and a half weeks, flown an aerial survey of the Kruger National Park. And the, and the purpose for that is to try and assess and determine the breeding population of three species of tree nesting vultures in 2 million hectares or 20,000 square kilometers of the Kruger National Park. Um, as you can assume, it's it's a time-consuming process. It's a very expensive undertaking. Using a helicopter like that, uh, we are supported by an NGO based in South Africa that provides, where we have volunteer pilots that make available their aircraft, whether it's a fixed wing or a helicopter, to do surveys, to move animals between areas, etc. And they've been assisting us for the last 12, 13 years in these surveys. Um, and of course, being in the air, being on a stable platform like a helicopter, it gives you, yeah, excuse the pun, a bird's eye view of vulture nests. And, and it's fairly effective to determine the level of activity, the stage of activity, et cetera, of the individual nests. The photograph that you see there is a leopard faced vulture mantling protectively over the chick that's in the nest. So by, by using the helicopter, you save a lot of time, you can cover a lot of ground, and you can fairly confidently quantify the breeding population of, of vultures in a protected area. Uh, the map here shows you uh, a, combi a, a combined survey that we've done so far. We did the first survey uh, of half of that in 2020 during the, the COVID lockdown. We were fortunate to be able to go to the Kruger Park, spend time in a beautiful landscape where there were at that time no tourists, believe it or not. And we flew half of the, of the survey then. And then in the last three weeks, we completed the the, the other part. Uh, so there's still a bit of a gap left, which we hope to complete next year to have a, a full idea of what the current population is. We completed a similar survey in 2015 already. Uh, and what we are doing now, especially considering the poisoning impact that we've seen in that landscape, is to determine the, the change in the breeding population over the last decade or so, um, to sort of look at population trends in one of the more important conservation areas in South Africa. But the idea would also be to use a similar approach in other key protected areas further north in Africa, where we have the capacity and where we have the funding available, uh, if we can acquire that, to do similar surveys to, to do this. We've uh, already conducted surveys in uh, Gorongosa National Park in, in Mozambique, um, and we are planning to do surveys elsewhere, but it all depends on 
funding and also having suitable aircraft available in these countries and obviously getting the clearance to fly to do more of this. Uh, we need to do a lot more to really get a, a good idea of what the breeding populations in these large protected areas are like and, and what the trends are over time. Something else uh, and an additional tool that we have identified and that we've started developing in Africa is to use sniffer dogs to assist us in detecting poisons uh, and to also assist at poisoning incidents in detecting poison carcasses, in detecting poison baits, etc. It's a technique and it's a tool that's been used extensively in many countries in Europe, uh, but the capacity does not exist in Africa at the moment. So in August this year, we uh, received support from the Junta Andalusia in Spain. They sent a team of their dog handlers and experts across to South Africa. We had a workshop at the Southern African Wildlife College uh, where we also invited dog handlers from different organizations to participate in this process. And we have initiated the process to develop this capacity in an African context. There are very many anti-poaching dogs and tracking dogs that are used in various projects across, in particular, East and Southern Africa. And transferring the skill and capacitating and upskilling will be a fairly straightforward process. It's just initiating it, which is what we started doing. And hopefully we will in the next uh, two to three years roll this out quite widely across the landscape and have the animals assist us in this very uh, important work. So um, it is a, it's a fairly new initiative, uh, but there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. And uh, any of you that have worked with people that work with dogs, especially work, dogs that work in conservation know that people are passionate and they are focused and driven. And if they can make a difference, they will adopt skills and techniques to do so. Um, and we are confident that, that this will be a significant step forward to assist people on the ground with the work that they are doing. The last of the projects that I that I can talk to is the higher level international engagement and advocacy. And, and that really comes about through the work that I've been doing uh, since the late 2000s, uh, through the establishment initially of the IUCN Vulture Specialist Group, and then also engaging with the higher level conservation conventions like the Convention on Migratory Species, working with CITES and others to promote vulture conservation. And I think the multi-species action plan that was developed under the auspices of the Convention on Migratory Species is a good outcome of, of that engagement. Uh, but of course, it's great to have a plan, but it's important to have that plan, plan implemented across the range. And uh, that's another major focus of the work that we do. And all of the organizations that you see the logos of at the bottom were partners in drafting the plan and promoting the plan, getting it adopted and also on our partners in promoting its implementation across the three continents that, that is the focus of the plan. So those are all of the structures that we actively engage with, that we provide input to, that we participate in. And you can see a lot of that focuses on the Convention on Migratory Species, um, and then also the IUCN structures, and then also promoting the International Vulture Awareness Day that we established in 2008 and has really become a, an institution on the international conservation calendar. I'll talk about that a bit more. But you can see that there's an extensive level of engagement at a higher level internationally, and it's important to do that, is to go and engage with governments at that level. It's the only way that you will effectively start communicating with them and get their buy-in into what we want to do. Uh, and it has worked uh, fairly effectively. But as always, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done and that continues to need to be done. Continuous engagement is critical, uh, both at higher level, but also uh, on the ground. We have worked with a number of countries in developing national conservation action plans for vultures, which is one of the actions recommended by the multi-species action plan. Zimbabwe was the first country in Africa that uh, finalized and signed off on its, on its conservation action plan. South Africa's plan is in, a, in the final stages. It will very likely be signed off as formal legislation in South Africa before the end of this year, uh, which I think is a major important step forward for us in, in the country that I live in. But we are also working with all of the other countries that are listed there in developing national action plans for each of those countries. And of course, those national plans should also feed into regional plans and facilitate the, the cross uh, cross border cooperation. We've also engaged with many stakeholders in West Africa, and we had a workshop late last year 
where we specifically focused on the impact and the threat of belief use but, uh, poisoning, but also the use of vultures in, in beliefs and in cultural practices. And uh, a separate focus strategy on that is almost complete and, and will be published pretty soon, uh, which brings together 15 countries in West Africa and advises them on what to do to, to reduce the impact of this practice. Um, and then in addition to that, we also work, uh, you know, the, the Rupel's vulture is an interesting species in that it has started, it was considered to be a sedentary species within sub-Sahara Africa, but some birds have started moving north with the Eurasian griffins. And in fact, some of them have crossed the Mediterranean and there is now a small breeding population of the species in southern Spain. So um, there's, there's quite interesting movements that the birds themselves are undertaking, probably as a result of the pressures that they feel within their existing range. And we are looking at changes in our own time, and it's important to keep note of that. And uh, there is a working group now with people from both Spain, Portugal, and then also North Africa that are working together in studying these movements, uh, assessing the impact that this might have. There are concerns, for instance, of uh, of the crossbreeding between Rupel's griffins and Eurasian griffins, which uh, which is likely, and and so on. So there's there's quite a bit of work that that is being done. But it's interesting to witness change in the range of species within our lifetime, as a result, on the one hand, probably of the pressures and the threats that they are feeding, but it could also be supported and driven by climate change. Um, it's just not being looked at to any degree uh, at this stage. So there's there's lots of interesting work happening as far as that is concerned. Something else that I just wanted to mention is, is dealing with energy, which is the second highest priority after, after poisoning um, that uh, affects vultures in Africa in particular. In South Africa, my organization has since 1996 had a very close working relationship with the energy utility or the power utility in the country. And we've partnered with uh, with them for, well, it's almost 30 years now, uh, working with them, advising them on making power lines and structures more safe for vultures in South Africa. It's cost lots of money. They've, they've invested literally millions in making lines safe and kilometers, literally thousands of kilometers of lines have been made more visible and have been made safe for vultures. But there's still a lot more that needs doing in our country. And the important thing for us is that very little is being done about this in other parts of Africa. So when you look at this map on the right hand side, all of those red lines that you see there are plans for the development of new networks of power lines to traverse the African landscape. And the reason for that is that 68% of the African population still does not have ready access to electricity. Uh, so you can understand the need and the need to provide in that need. But it's important for us to be part of that process and to advise developers and governments to ensure that the routing of these power lines are done in such a way that they minimize the risk of impact to vultures as such. So we have been working in all of the countries that are listed there to try and develop similar models to what we have here in South Africa uh, that has had a positive impact locally and to hopefully roll that out over time across the rest of Africa so that people take note and that they start quantifying the impact, but most importantly is to reduce the risk of this happening in the first place by appropriate development and by developments in areas where the risk to vultures is minimized. So it's, a, it's an important initiative uh, that's in its infancy, but there's been good progress in countries like Kenya um, and Ethiopia and so on to initiate this process already. Just some examples of, of the, the impact of the work that we uh, that we are doing. As far as this training is concerned that I mentioned earlier, uh, we conducted two of these workshops in Kenya. We trained trainers there, and this is the first workshop that you can see there where they are taught uh, investigation techniques, making sure that people are safe when, when they are working at these scenes, and to do things legally in, in the correct manner and to make sure that the right uh, officers are on scenes when uh, when it's necessary what the kenya wildlife service has done after those that training is to take our protocols and to develop a national protocol to manage poisoning incidents across all of kenya and every wildlife officer in the kenya wildlife service is trained in these protocols and know what to do regardless of where they are deployed and in fact it's used at their ranger academy 
to train all of the entry level rangers in the same in the same discipline. So what you have is people that are deployed in the landscape that are now fully versed in the risk of poison and also what to do and how to manage these incidents effectively. And as you saw the figures earlier, more than 3000 individuals have now been trained in Kenya uh, and know what to do and how to manage these incidents effectively, which I think is a major step forward. There are other countries like Zambia that's very close to the same same sort of step. Uh, and hopefully we can duplicate this in many other countries across the continent as well. What I want to share with you, if, if people don't know how to manage these incidents, um, is that the impact can be much more severe than, uh, than, than what people anticipate. This is an example of an incident that happened in the South Luangwa National Park in 2016, where an elephant was poached uh, after the, the ivory was taken. The poachers poison the carcass, as they sometimes do. It's one of the methods of poisoning, one of the drivers of poisoning that we do know of. There was a big poisoning incident in which initially 80 odd vultures were poisoned. There were some hyenas killed in this incident. The rangers went to the scene, they investigated, they removed the vulture carcasses, the, the jackals and the hyenas. Those carcasses were destroyed, but they left the elephant carcass right there. It was so it was so large, they couldn't really move it. Um, and when I went into training there, we went back to the scene uh, about two months after the incident had taken place, and we found the remains of more vultures that were poisoned there. We counted the remains of at least 14 hooded vultures and a number of other uh, whiteback vultures that had also succumbed there, and there were signs of many more hyenas also likely being poisoned and having died as a result of feeding on the poisoned carcass. We then went and we sat down and we strategized as far as the South Longa National Park is concerned. We brought all stakeholders together. We drafted a poison response strategy for that entire area and everybody bought into it. It was published and everybody knew what to do and what their role was within the strategy. And it was tested fairly quickly after it was rolled out. Within a month, another elephant was poisoned inside the National Park. The, the animal died. And a guide that was on, on the training that we presented was sitting at this carcass when a pride of 20 lions started feeding on this poisoned elephant. He noticed very quickly that the lion started behaving abnormally. He raised the alarm to the appropriate uh, structure, uh, to the ops room. Within 90 minutes, they had a veterinarian and a veterinary team deployed on the scene. You can see the veterinarian uh, sitting there next to one of the lions. They were able to dart uh, the animals that were there when they arrived, two lions that had fortunately died already. But the other 18 lions that they found there, they were able to initiate treatment in the field over a period of 10 days, and they saved every single lion. All of those lions are alive today as a result of the intervention of this team that was mobilized and that knew what to do. And the only animals that were lost as a result of this poisoning incident was the elephant and two lions. There were no vultures lost. There were no jackals or hyenas lost in this incident. Um, and of course, that, that's a hugely positive income. And since then, the team in the Luangwa has been on the front foot in, in reducing the impact of, of poisoning, but also very importantly, by working in communities, reducing the prevalence of poisoning in the Luangwa Valley, where it used to be almost endemic. It now is a far less common phenomenon. And when it happens, they respond fast and they reduce the impact of these poisoning incidents. So for me, it's it's an excellent example of what can be achieved when people use the training and the skills that they've been given optimally. Uh, and again, you know, there are numerous other examples from elsewhere on the continent where successful response and successful use and planning and being prepared has made a huge difference, not just to vultures, but to other wildlife also. Uh, this is the the carcass of the of the poisoned elephant being destroyed. And as I say, you know, as I said, the successful intervention, uh, the rangers doing the decontamination of the scene prevented any further poisoning from taking place. It's a hard task. It took four days to destroy that elephant carcass so that it didn't pose a poisoning risk to any other animal. But it's a, an important task that must be done. And when people realize that and they do the appropriate and they follow the protocols, you can make a significant difference. Yeah, I mean, I, I've shared with you quite a lot of negatives in terms of poisoning and other impacts. But it's also important to look at some of the, the, the positives. What you see, the photograph that you see here is of a, a sub-adult Cape vulture, which is a species near endemic to Southern Africa. Um, it's a species that was listed as endangered as, recent, uh, as recently as two years ago. 
but uh, we did a reassessment of the population and the population trends, and in particular, looking at uh, breeding colonies of the species uh, within the range, particularly in South Africa, the breeding colonies, the larger ones in particular, are currently at the highest level in terms of the number of breeding pairs since we started monitoring the population of Cape Baltas in Southern Africa in 1973. Uh, and the reason for that is concerted and coordinated conservation action over 50 years by a wide range of stakeholders, by landowners, by communities. And we've managed to turn that negative trend over 100 years around into a positive now. And in fact, the species two years ago was downlisted from endangered to vulnerable. And for me, it's an important example of what can be done with regards to vulture conservation in the rest of the continent. If we work together and we support each other and we work across international boundaries, we can make a difference and we can turn around this big negative that we all are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis when you do work uh, with vultures, in particular in Africa. I mentioned that I will just uh, would like to highlight International Vulture Awareness Day. It's been an important tool to create awareness amongst the wider public uh, globally. It's now a global event. This year, uh, organizations from 38 countries registered their participation on the, on the website. Uh, we are aware that there were many more uh, organizations that participated, but they didn't bother registering. But it is a, a strong vehicle uh, through which we can promote vulture conservation, not just in Africa, but across the world. In fact, there were uh, of those 38 countries came from all continents on the planet. So the message is starting to get out there. Uh, and of course, having a single day to uh, create awareness is not enough. And of course, it's a continuous process, but it's important that we do highlight the work that is being done across the range, both for old world vultures and for new world vultures. And the day so it's, it's, has gone from strength to strength since the establishment in 2008. Um, and there's a lot more positive uh, buy-in from, from organizations and it has grown substantially over the last 15 years. So it's, uh, yeah, it's also, for me, it's a positive to see the uptake in, in terms of, and the awareness uh, of the need to conserve vultures, not just in Africa, but across the world. Of course, the work that we do uh, in the program that I'm managing is not possible without partners and without donors that provide a lot of the funding that we use to do the work that we do. Uh, but moving into Africa, it's very, very tricky if you don't have partners in country. Uh, and those partners are critical to the work that we do. And we appreciate each and every one of them as we appreciate the donors that provide the funding for the work that we do. And the slide is just an acknowledgement of both of the, the partners and the donors that we are working with and that we've engaged with to date. Uh, and again, thank you to them for their support and for working with us to achieve the goals that we have set. Of course, it's always important to look towards the future and to keep on scanning the horizon for potentially new threats that could affect vultures and could affect the habitats uh, that they are dependent on. And it's important for us to keep being on the lookout, being aware, and then to come up with innovative ways to reduce any new threats that might emerge. Um, and I'm happy to say that we are doing so, and we are doing so in Africa as a combined team of people that work together and that look towards these challenges uh, and, and really are working effectively together, which for me is, is a huge positive. It's probably one of the bigger drivers in terms of that keeps one going when you get to countries and when you get to, and you start working with people and they are as motivated as you are, if not more, in making a difference and working to the benefit of vultures and the habitats that they are in, and also to benefit the communities that uh, live in these areas that they share with vultures. It's important that we do the work because I think this is an important saying, and it's something that I certainly will give my last drop of blood to achieve or to prevent from happening is it's almost unimaginable to think that Africa's skies can be empty of vultures. But there are certain parts of the continent where it's happened. And uh, when you saw just a little bit of that video initially, um, it shows you how the vulture ranges have shrunk. But it's important for us to stop this and to turn this around and to turn it into a positive. We will probably never regain the range that vultures had historically. But if we can maintain populations in these crucial strongholds, and to make sure that they stay there, that is key. And that is what many of us are working towards to prevent a scenario where there are simply no vultures in the African landscape. 
And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity again for asking me to spend some time with you to tell you just a little bit about the work we are doing. As I, as I said, you know, it's it's very difficult to to try and be brief uh, when when you work across such a wide landscape with the range of species we do and with uh, with the range of countries that we do engage in. But hopefully, this provided you with some insight into the work we are doing, and hopefully, those of you that are interested in the tracking side of things. Um, have a little bit of insight in, in in what we are busy with and what we are doing, uh, but more than happy to to uh, answer more questions uh, if there's time available and to to talk with you more. Thanks very much for your time. Bonjour à tous. Alors, euh, on va essayer de résumer ça très rapidement. C'était une présentation très complète. Alors, euh, la, la, le sujet de la présentation était la conservation des vautours en Afrique par André Botta de l'Endangered Wildlife Trust. Euh, il y a eu un déclin très marqué des vautours ces 40 dernières années en Afrique. Euh, D'abord, euh, André a essayé de nous montrer une vidéo qui va aussi être euh, disponible en français avec un lien, donc euh, je vous invite à la, à la regarder. Euh, les menaces sur les vautours sont euh, essentiellement dues aux empoisonnements dans 61% des cas. Euh, C'est très commun, notamment pour euh, euh, éviter les, la prédation par les grands carnivores, que des poisons soient utilisés mais aussi dans certains cas même pour des grands herbivores comme les éléphants. Et euh, dans un peu moins d'un tiers des cas, il y a aussi une utilisation des vautours pour la médecine traditionnelle et donc du braconnage. Euh, ensuite, euh, un problème qui est en, en, en train de, de grandir en Afrique, c'est les collisions avec les lignes à haute tension, euh, les éoliennes et les autres infrastructures. Euh, la priorité euh, du travail d'André Botta, c'est de résoudre le problème de l'empoisonnement. Euh, le problème, c'est que les poisons sont d'accès très simple, très facile à obtenir, donc c'est un gros défi. Il faut notamment améliorer la législation, interdire certaines substances, limiter leur accès en Afrique. Une autre partie du travail qui est fait, c'est un entraînement de réponse en cas d'empoisonnement dans différents pays, c'est surtout en Afrique australe et en Afrique de l'Est, dans 17 pays. Plus de 7000 personnes, notamment des rangers de parcs, ont été entraînées. C'est aussi nécessaire d'améliorer les les connaissances et les capacités de développement dans les pays. Et, euh, il y a eu des projets qui ont été faits dans différents pays en Afrique et aussi à Oman et au Cambodge. Euh, en Afrique australe, dans plusieurs pays, euh, des systèmes d'alerte rapide ont été, euh, ont été mis en œuvre. Euh, il y a des vautours qui ont été équipés avec des balises. Euh, cela permet de découvrir des incidents plus rapidement euh, et de décontaminer des sites. Euh, ensuite, André a présenté des données très intéressantes de suivi par satellite. Euh, des larges distances sont couvertes par ces vautours, donc la, leur conservation va très largement au-delà des, des barrières des parcs. Donc c'est beaucoup plus compliqué de protéger des vautours qui sont mobiles et qui n'ont pas de frontières politiques et géographiques que, que des, des mammifères qui vont rester dans leur parc clôturé. Euh, donc euh, André a souligné que c'est essentiel pour conserver les vautours en Afrique de se focaliser sur les métapopulations et pas seulement au niveau local. Et donc, euh, il y a un réseau de détection qui a été créé dans toute l'ère de distribution des vautours euh, après la, le congrès de, de, de panafricain d'ornithologie en 2022 et qui, euh, qui a pour but d'être étendu à, à, tout, à plusieurs, plus de pays maintenant, aussi hors d'Afrique. Il y a aussi une collaboration avec l'Arabie saoudite euh, qui souhaiterait introduire les vautours fauves et conserver le père Knopter, les vautours Oriku et au Cambodge qui euh, contient trois populations, euh, des populations isolées de trois espèces de vautours asiatiques qui sont en danger critique d'extinction également. Euh, ensuite, André a parlé aussi des battleurs, battleurs des savanes qui sont également largement des charognards et ils sont vulnérables à l'empoisonnement, donc c'est aussi un enjeu de conservation et tout comme les vautours, euh, André a montré une grande mobilité chez ces oiseaux et euh, cela souligne le besoin aussi d'étendre les connaissances sur la mobilité des les déplacements, les mouvements des oiseaux en Afrique, notamment des rapaces. Euh, ensuite, il y a eu l'exemple d'un projet de recensement beaucoup plus complet dans le parc Kruger qui a été mené, euh, donc, euh, qui permet un recensement plus précis des populations de vautours. Et euh, quelques techniques qui ont été développées, notamment euh, l'utilisation de chiens renifleurs. Euh, un engagement international donc, est nécessaire à plus haut niveau également, et c'est ce à quoi André travaille en ce moment. Et euh, il y a eu des, des exemples qui ont été donnés aussi de, de changements positifs, donc par exemple l'expansion du vautour de Ruppel vers la péninsule ibérique. Et euh, une autre priorité maintenant, c'est le développement des infrastructures énergétiques 
qui sont une menace croissante. Donc, euh, André a montré un exemple des, des plans de développement des, des infrastructures électriques en Afrique. Et il est nécessaire de réduire le risque de ces installations pour les rapaces. Et pour continuer, on a eu des exemples, encore des, des magnifiques exemples d'entraînement au Kenya et ailleurs, euh, et aussi euh, des exemples un peu plus tristes, des problèmes qui peuvent survenir en cas euh, de réponse non appropriée lors d'empoisonnement. Donc, euh, c'est nécessaire d'éliminer les carcasses, autrement on peut avoir des, des, des problèmes encore longtemps après la découverte de la carcasse. Et euh, dans un, dans un sujet qui est quand même assez, assez triste, on a des très bonnes nouvelles. Donc, il y avait l'exemple du vautour du Cap, qui a, dont les populations ont pu être stabilisées, même se rétablir en Afrique du Sud. Et euh, André a ensuite euh, mentionné ses partenaires et l'importance d'avoir des partenaires locaux fiables pour mener la conservation des vautours. Et le, le, le take-home message, le, le, message, le, mo le message de fin de, ce, de cette présentation, c'est qu'il est impossible d'imaginer une Afrique sans vautour. Donc, euh, c'est nécessaire de protéger ces oiseaux et de permettre le rétablissement de leur population là où ils ont déjà disparu. Et euh, merci à André pour cette magnifique vue d'ensemble du travail et les touches d'espoir dans un sujet qui est quand même très triste dans l'ensemble. Merci.